All right. Welcome, kings and queens. We are back in the palace, baby, live and in full effect. It is business as usual around here. You hear me? It is business. You hear me? <laughs> I think I got that from the color purple. You hear me? But listen, we are back to business. We do what we do, and let's have a good old time. We're going to cover some content. And this is Love and Marriage. I'm a little bit behind, so please forgive me, but we're going to talk Love and Marriage Season 8, Episode 4. I do believe Episode 5 aired this weekend, but your girl is a day late and a dollar short. Please bear with me. I believe in disconnecting and establishing a little bit of balance. But here I am, ready to go. So are you ready, Palace? We are going to talk Episode 4. <clears throat> And I am going to cover five different components. I am going to talk about Kimmy and Tisha, the dynamics between Kimmy and Tisha, okay? But within that dynamic, I am going to primarily focus on Kimmy. So we're going to talk Kimmy and Letitia. We're also going to talk Martel and Lunell. We're going to talk Stormy and Courtney, point number three. We're going to talk... Well, actually, it's kind of like a combination of Stormy, Courtney, and Trish. So that's still point number three. We're going to talk about Chris and Martel, their scene, and then we're going to wrap it up with point number five, Maurice and Marcel. Let's jump in. For those of you who are just tuned in or if you're new to the channel, welcome to the palace. I am Queen Sheba. I cover a variety of hot topics specific to reality television, but most importantly, I hone in on the psychological and the behavioral traits of the Black experience. Subscribe now. So listen, we're coming hot out the gates. Letitia and uh, Kimmy, that, that was the first scene that the camera pans in on. They're sitting there and they're waiting. This is It starts off with Letitia and Destiny, but keep in mind they are waiting for Destiny to arrive. So while they're there, they, they're going to talk. The camera takes advantage of the two ladies being alone. But I, I, I also want y'all to notice that Letitia and Kimmy never film. I don't recall them often filming apart from each other. And let me tell you what I feel, feel like the Scots have done. They've set each other up to guarantee each other a paycheck. When Marceau and Maurice meet together to, to go with the other guys, they show up together. This guarantees that each couple will receive a paycheck, right? Because if you are not in a scene, you don't get paid. So... Carlos King and the production team allows the Scots to have a guaranteed paycheck, no matter the uh, quality of the content that they bring to the scene. It could be shit. It could be excellent. It could be whatever. They have managed to utilize their power and numbers to ensure that they keep checks flowing throughout their households. Marceau and Maurice are always together. Kimmy and Letitia are always together when it comes to the other women. Therefore, Kimmy and Letitia are guaranteed to get paid. Marceau and Maurice are guaranteed to get paid. I don't like that. We're not in high school. We got four separate individuals, four separate personalities. I would like to see, as if we're watching Big Brother, some of these teams and combos and these twosomes broken up. I would approach it. From the angle of a Big Brother television show, we've got to start separating them. Because to me, it does an uh, injustice to the television show, to the level of production that could be. Because they're not really bringing anything um, when they're there. They know they don't have to. And it's kind of working against you, Carlos. When you start hiring too many family members, because they run your stuff, right? But anywho... Letitia and Kimmy are there. They start to talk. And it sounds like they have this business deal that the two couples have entered into. And they're hesitant. They're talking business, but both seem to be hesitant about entering into business together. So Kimmy kind of shares that she's hesitant because, you know, time, I really want to deliver for my client. Time is of, es of essence. I don't want to be late. And I feel like that's low-key shade. Because she's saying to Letitia, girl, y'all have a history of not delivering. So then Letitia chimes back in response to Kimmy. Well, as long as you got money, time is not a factor. And I was like, oh, the shade of it all. The shade of it all. Here's my thing. 
what Letitia is saying, low key is do you and Reese, I mean, as long as you and Reese got the money, we'll be on time. <laughs> so that kind of made me think, is there a money issue with Kimmy and Reese? Like, okay, I don't know. Would you do business with your family? Um, is it easier to give a stranger instructions, guidance, as opposed to trying to give it to a family member? What are your thoughts? Me personally, uh, that's a tough one. I don't know. But anywho, so Destiny comes into the room and immediately Kimmy and Letitia go into character. To me, they go into character, right? Um, And they start to deflect and paint a negative picture of what they had to do to reassure, to what I presume to be reassuring Destiny. And to me, in my head, I said, oh, okay. It seems as if they do not want to disappoint Destiny. And I feel like maybe Destiny plays for keeps when it comes to her friends. If I'm friends with you, you can't be friends with her. If this is the way it goes, this is what you got to do. That's a hard way to live. So Kimmy and Tisha completely, in my opinion, manipulate the conversation and they try to throw Destiny off as if they really didn't want to meet with Sonny and then Kimmy. That's why I said I'm going to focus on Kimmy. Kimmy manipulates the situation, in my opinion, where Destiny can't really push back because she introduced cancer as a reason, as her primary reason for speaking with Sonny. Where do you really go with that? Okay. Follow me closely. This is not really for me about Destiny and Moses and Sonny in this scene. I was watching the manipulation tactics introduced to the conversation by Kimmy. Kimmy was being messy. She set up the scene with uh, Sonny. She also set up the scene to have Letitia come to give her backup because she knew Letitia had more ill will towards Sonny because of the sensitivity that Letitia has to being cheated on, okay, allegedly. But what she does to shut destiny down and she says well Sonny was there for me when I had cancer and destiny said oh oh okay because what I mean literally you would look like a bitch you would look like a bitch to say anything outside of that so that was a manipulation tactic in my opinion technically Kimmy that's an emotionally manipulative play even though Sonny may have been there for you, let's let's keep it real, Kimmy. Let's keep it real, real, and let's be grown about this. That's not the reason you had that conversation with Sonny. You had that conversation with Sonny to be messy. You had that conversation with Sonny so that you could get more camera time. So that you could guarantee your salary for the season. Okay? in my opinion. And you also had that conversation with Sonny because it would take, in my opinion, the spotlight, the, the uh, spotlight off of you and Maurice, off of you and Maurice's lackluster performance, because I don't know where y'all were going with that storyline last year, but it was definitely cringeworthy. It was uncomfortable for, for the women it was just horrible. And I feel like this was an opportunity that knocked and you seized on it. People stopped talking about you and Maurice. And this was your opportunity to stir the pot when it comes to Sunny and Destiny. Okay. That's, that's just my opinion. Now, I said I was going to focus on Kimmy. I don't like the strategy game that she's playing. It's a very uh, ugly game, in my opinion. And it's a game that's played by mature women who like to introduce a nice, nasty card. Nice slash nasty. What does that mean? They do both at the same time. Pick a card, pick a card, pick any card, pick a card, pick a card, pick any card. I'm going to pick nice, nasty. And you say, no, you got to be nice or nasty. I'm going to be both. I'm going to be both. And that's what I feel like Kimmy does very well. 
she comes across or she presents herself, those type of women, they come across and present themselves as attempting to be helpful when really they're not interested in anybody's well-being except their own. So then the manipulation strategy, the second one that Kimmy introduces is uh, the girl code because she knows that's important to destiny. So they introduce the girl code into the conversation in order to neutralize destiny by saying that Sonny broke the girl code. Okay. So we got the cancer code in play. We got the girl code in play. Both or which both, both of them, which are being used to benefit Kimmy and not necessarily destiny. Do you get what I'm saying? As a matter of fact, they're being used to shut Destiny down and hush her up. Because, bitch, you ain't going to be able to say nothing to me. First of all, I gave you a little bit of what you needed and what you wanted. Y'all got to be careful with letting people know your flaws. Everybody knows that friendship is so important to Destiny. That Destiny uh, plays for keeps. It's uh, all or nothing. And so what Kimmy did is she felt she kind of catered to you. I'm going to give you something. That's a little bit for me. And I went to see Sunny because she was there for me when I had cancer. And then I'm going to give you a little bit for you. One for me, one for you. One for me, one for you. So yeah, also, Sunny broke the girl code. I mean, what are you, a producer? What are you this? Kimmy is a nice, nasty woman. And listen, Kimmy, how come, Kimmy, if you and Destiny are really, really friends like that, in real life. How come you didn't call her? How come you didn't call her on the phone prior to meeting with Sunny to see if she's okay with that? Because you actually met with Sunny to talk about Destiny's business and Sunny's business and not your own. Okay. How come you waited if you're really friends with Destiny? How come you waited until the cameras were rolling? before you told your good friend in real life. Remember when I told y'all last season, Kimmy is one of those women where you think you're okay and then you fuck around and you find out there's inside jokes, there's low-key shade, there's nice nasty when she shows up in front of everybody else. One of them women, you be like, what's up? That ain't the same energy that you keep when we by ourselves. She put on. You'd be like, oh, ouch, what was that? That's what Kimmy is, okay? Kimmy can't be trusted, in my opinion. I want to say this. Um, the Scots are very lowly people in spirit. And I feel like they have somewhat of a takedown spirit when it comes to other people. I don't know how they got there. But that's the kind of energy <clears throat> that I pick up from the Scots. It's natural for them. They tag team you. It's like good cop versus bad cop. And not only are the men good at it, but so are the women. So are the women. The women evoke it on the, uh, on the uh, other women, the younger women, okay? Because until Nell came into the picture, Kimmy and Letitia, believe it or not, were the older women. Letitia's actually older than what we think she is. So before Nell came into the picture, Kimmy and Letitia were the oldest. And the men use similar tactics with the younger men. Essentially, what, I, what I'm kind of saying is they're bullies when you put all of them together, okay? I feel like they're opportunistic bullies, They wind you up for failure. And what I mean by wind you up for failure, I'm I'm, going to shout everything from the mountaintop to get you hype, to get you ready for divorce, to get you to go confront somebody. I'm going to wind you up, wind you up. I'm going to say everything I need to say, which is why I constantly challenge people and ask people, did anybody else tell you different? No. Oh, you being wound up like a fool because either people are afraid of you or they don't respect you. Either they are afraid of you or they don't respect you. So the Scots are the type, they're going to wind you up. 
to set you up for failure, wind you up in your wrongness, and let you go out and make a fool of yourself for their entertainment, okay? When they told Destiny, well, you should, um, you should speak with Sonny. Y'all, that was a setup. Why the f- would you tell an ex-girlfriend, an ex-side chick, an ex-sneaky link to go talk to a wife? That man has disconnected from her. There is no need for them to talk. I don't give a damn if Destiny refused to get out of bed for three years. That's horrible advice to send her knocking on a man's door to have a conversation with his wife. Do you know how pitiful that would look? And yet they said, well, maybe you should talk to Sonny. And what they're trying to do, in my opinion, is they're trying to produce this catastrophic television moment because that will be the first time in history where we actually see a side chick Whatever, Destiny, I have no idea what you were doing with Moses. And pardon my language, I don't know how to say it, but I'm going to do my best. I think you was giving out charity fucks when when it comes to Moses. I think you let Moses run all through you over the course of the past 15 years in exchange for money here and there donations via cash app because you said it in your one-on-one sit down with him. Well, you had just sent me money. Yeah. After you left, that's no different than a nigga putting cash on a dresser for a whore that he had a good old time with the night before. So why would you give somebody like destiny at the level that Moses valued her Advice to go sit down and talk to his wife. That, the Scots are bullies. They will wind you up and sit back and relax. Because if I can send you out to be boo-boo the fool and act like Sam Sausage Head, I ain't got to do shit. I ain't got to give up nothing when it comes to my life, okay? That would have been a catastrophic television moment, something we've never seen before in the history of reality television outside of love and hip hop, okay? And they would have viewed it as entertainment the same way they viewed the demise of Martell and Melody's family when it ended. They helped. Letitia helped. Kimmy helped. Maurice helped. Marceau helped. Everybody knew. They, They enjoyed it. And they watched it burn to the ground. And then they came back and they brutalized, tormented, and bullied Melody for the sins of Mar- of, of Martell. If you're not careful, the Scots will chew you up and spit you out to remain on top. Which tells me that Carlos recruits a particular type. He recruits a particular type. Now, they tried to do it with Nell and Chris the first year that Nell and Chris were on the show by not inviting them, alienating them, dismissing them from uh, group activities. We call it hazy. Tisha then says, I had a uh, meetup with Mel and baby Kimmy jumped in and said, "Call, call it what it was. It was a gathering. I felt like Kimmy was saying, don't put shit on it. Don't give it no extra. I really didn't want to be there. And that was cold language between those three. Girl, it was no meetup. It was a gathering. We did that for TV. You know what time it is. She was letting Destiny know, child. We had the film with her. That's what I took from that. What about y'all? What about y'all? I feel like Kimmy is a very complex piece of work. I want to say nasty, but I'm going to say complex piece of work. And she's completely different behind the scenes as opposed to uh, being in Melody's face. I feel like behind the scenes when she gets together with Destiny and Letitia, she seems to come across as more messy. Okay, honey, we finna get into this scene with Martell and Nell. Listen, y'all are gonna be shocked about what I'm about to say, but I'ma say it anyway. Martell ate. He ate down in this scene, honey. He cooked and he served up a buffet with no sides, okay? 
He ate Nell's up and he ate Nell's ass up in this scene. And that's what you get now. That's exactly what you get. That's what you get for being messy. Now you too old to be that damn uh, messy and meddling in those young folks' marriage. Sit back, relax, and be a castmate. I feel like Nell is a meddler, okay? And I feel like she plays the fence, rides the fence, and she kind of plays both Martell and Melody. And I wish they both would see that and minimize the amount of information that they share with her because she does not come bearing gifts. She comes bearing deceit and betrayal. Because after she leaves, both of you, when meeting with you individually, she carries the bone to each of you. She'll come back to Melody and tell him everything disruptive, dark in detail that Martell has said, and she'll do the thing, do the same with Melody. Well, here's where it gets kind of tricky. Sometimes I feel like she tries to captivate the audience more so with Martell than when she's filming with Mel, because after she's done being messy, she always tries to leave it as if she's on Melody's side. I don't think anybody's looking for you to pick a side. I think people are looking for you to be a grown woman and stop being messy at your age. I really am disappointed with Nell because Nell, I was, I really was looking forward to you as a breakout star in your own right as an older beautiful woman, in my opinion. And you have by far been the most disappointing because you have the resources to do it. You have uh, the looks to do it. You have the business to do it. You have the kids to do it. And you have fallen short. And I'm not sure why. I'm not sure why you have sold yourself short to be a part of the crowd. When you're a woman who's very capable of walking in her own lane, just because of your experience and your age. And to be honest, your age is actually a benefit in this scenario. But I feel like you've mismanaged your opportunity, and it's extremely disappointing to me watching it play out on screen. Okay? I'll believe it or not, y'all. I don't know. Why you say that? Because I'm not committed to hating anybody. He ate in this scene. He put her in her place in this scene because she's been out of her place for quite some time. And what I mean by that is you have constantly poked your nose in their affairs. You have constantly kept up chaos, chaos and strife within those two. And you can just sit back, relax and focus on your own family and try to get things right with your stepdaughter. You get what I'm saying? Okay. You cannot afford to be running back and forth telling each one of them what the other said. It's just not a good look. It's not a good look. Okay, a messenger like Nell, they they operate on winning the trust of both sides. I'm going to win your trust and I'm going to win your trust. And that's what she did with both Martel and Mel. And she pretends to be the safe confidant. And then she betrays both parties by encouraging strife. By encouraging strife is you keep shit up. You go back and say this and you say that. And sometimes they say it completely wrong. And now you're wrong. Stay out of their business. And that's what Nell is doing. But she forgot who the hell she was dealing with. And baby, that narc named Martel Holt just narc, narc, narc all over you. He reminded Nell to stay in her lane as it relates to her age. He basically called you a senior citizen on camera. Okay. And not only that, he looked in your face and he reminded you that in addition to your age, he didn't say this, but he alluded to it. And whatever he called you or said, they used the barking dog to bleep out the word. I kind of feel like he low key called you a hoe without directly saying it, which is why Chris came heated to confront him. Okay. Whatever he said to your face was the equivalent of calling you a whore. And then he attacked your age in a confessional. So you had little to no chance of recovery. What he did is he hit you with his best shot. He hit you with his best shot. 
And I know you're on life support at this point. Because you're trying to run with those young girls, but baby, you got it wrong. Your lane is your lane. Like Miss Marlene say, stay in your lane. Stay in your lane, okay? <laughs> Please. You don't meet up with people to shoot a scene, to manipulate them and try to tell them what they should be doing. That's meddlesome. It ain't your damn business what that man got going on with his ex-wife and his kids. That man called you a side in your face. He called you a side in your face. I'm going to ride with the first wife. Because le- the first wife said you was messing with her husband, who was then Chris Fletcher. And he was traveling for business. And when she found out, she had a sit down with you. And you told her that you had no intention of seeing him. Yet you did the opposite. And Martel reminded you of that. And I feel like you had no choice but to run back to your confessional. Because you did not stand a chance of winning going back and forth with Martel. So my question to you, Nell and Chris, is what exactly does Martel have on y'all? Before I shift, I am going, before I shift and I, I, I talk about Chris and Martell's scene, if I could give Trish one recommendation, I would say quit talking to Stormy. Stormy doesn't give a damn. You can see it in her face when she's looking at you. She's reading you. She's sizing you up like a python. She's sizing you up to see what angle she can take advantage of you. She appears to be kind. She appears to be uh, very thoughtful, but she don't have that. Not one ounce in her to be thoughtful and kind. She's figuring out how she can better exploit you, what her next question is going to be so that you wow that camera to guarantee her spot on this show. That's what I'm picking up. You can see it in her face. Your scenes with her are television moments. Nothing more, nothing less. She's pretending, but she does not give not one damn about you. And Trish, it's my hope that you have not established an unhealthy connection with Kent, but I believe you have. And I'm scared. I'm scared for Kent and not scared for you because based on how you've described your reactions to people, places, and things, I'm scared that if Kent decides that this is not a good fit for him, your response may not be favorable for him. Now let's shift to Chris and Martell. They come in, they shoot at Martell's investment property. The first thing I thought when Martell opened that door, this is before Arion Curry came out. I don't even listen to her, but this is before she came out and y'all started to do commentary on her. And it seems like that you guys have gotten or picked up from her that she's wanting to leave or is threatening to leave Huntsville. Now, before this came out, the first thing I thought to myself is when I watched Chris Fletcher walk through that door, I thought, Arion, you have no idea the level of pain that you are about to endure. A strong thought came to my head when Chris came through that door because what I saw was a new beginning for Martell. Listen to me. What I saw was a new beginning for Martell. Martell is in a good place, believe it or not. He's working. The Bible says when a man don't work, he don't eat. Martell just gathered a boost of confidence by finishing that property. And if the truth be told, the house looks good. So that's a win for him. Something that he didn't think that he could do outside of his ex-wife because his, his introduction to doing that level of work, they did it as a team. So now he's achieved and he's accomplished something on his own as a single man. And he's proud of himself. Okay. It's a television moment. The cameras were there to celebrate him. And all I could think is, Arion, your time is up. He's used you for your physical labor, both in the bedroom and for that house. Your time is up. And as soon as he gets back on his feet, because the best way to keep a person going and productive 
is to see the results. You know why you stay on a diet and why people do diets? Not because they want to restrict their caloric intake. They like the way they look after they lose the first 10 pounds. So that house is the first 10 pounds and it's going to push him to do it again and to do it again and to do it again. And he's probably going to do it again because it's a feeling of euphoria. He feels good. And now the cameras are showing up and he's getting exactly what he envisioned. People saying, ooh, ah, as he should. He should have been doing that a long time ago. But here's where it's going to become very painful for you, Arion. As soon as he gets back on his feet, he's going to leave you exactly where he found you. He is going to leave you in a position and in the condition that he found you in. With all due respect, he's going to leave you as a peasant. He's going to leave you with little to nothing but a little boy that you call Knox. He's going to leave you with the boy. He is going to leave you. And he's going to find a woman that he deems worthy of providing for. That he deems worthy of moving into one of those big elaborate homes that he built with his hands on his own post-divorce when everybody said he could not do it. It's not going to be you, honey. And you are going to be staring at yourself on live, looking in your camera with your hair all over your head, wondering where in the hell did you do with your life and where in the hell did you go wrong? You know, there are women like Ariane that have had to learn the hard way, unfortunately. Some of you insist on learning hard. You insist on learning hard. Heartbroken and all. And Ariane is one of those women, okay? She's going to be heartbroken and she's not going to be able to recover from what I perceive to be one of the most devastating episodes because he's going to, she's, she's of age now. You remember she like she loved to brag on her youth, but now she's a good 30, 33 to 35. I think he's going to squeeze out a little bit more juice from you as a turnip. He's going to build one or two. I'm, I'm going to give him maybe two more houses and then he's going to cut the cord forever, but he will not allow you to reap the fruits of his labor. Mark my words. Reese and Marcel. Now this scene actually happened earlier um, in this episode, but I wanted to save it to last for, for last. Marcel and Maurice, they tried to sun Moses in my opinion. Now I know a lot of you don't care for Moses, and I'm not saying I do or I don't. I'm just giving commentary. I know a lot of you don't care for Moses, but I like the way he showed up in this scene because he didn't let these two old ass niggas try to sun him. And that's exactly what they did. Marcel more so than Maurice. Maurice feeds off of Marcel, but Moses was throwing haymakers in that motherfucker as he should be. How you going to tell that man how to run his house and what conversations he should be having when it comes to his wife. So in that scene, Moses let them know, no, it ain't that type of party. It ain't that type of conversation. And I applaud him for that because the Scots have hazed, the Scots men and women have hazed every man and woman that have come on this show. They did it to Lewis and they tried to do it to Moses in the same place. And Moses wouldn't have in that shit. Now follow me very closely. They tried to haze that man by encroaching on his marriage and giving him unsolicited advice off jump when neither one of them are in a position to do so. Okay. Neither one of them are in a position to do so. Low key Moses is what Marceau wishes he could be. In my opinion, let's talk about it. Take your feelings off the table. Let's just talk about it. Moses is a younger version. He's youthful. He's in shape. He's confident. <laughs> His hips are smaller. <laughs> Look. And he 
has a beautiful wife. He has a beautiful wife. What does that mean? A lot. He has a beautiful wife. I'm going to leave it. I'm I'm not. Listen, a lot. Marcel and Maurice married out of necessity to escape the lives that they were living. Necessity. Survival. That ain't love. I'm marrying you because I have to. I need to get the hell up out of here. And I'm, you, you, okay, so let me get back on track. Hold on. Marceau don't give a damn about Moses or Sonny. These goofballs were trying to test Moses' gangster. They were trying to test his gangster to see how weak of a man he really was. Because, see, men test each other differently. I'm going to talk at you, nigga. And I'm not going to talk with you. I'm going to spew A, B, C, D. And I'm going to talk at you. And that's why Moses was jockeying for position. It's man talk. See, I'm not going to just let you talk at me. And I'm going to sit here and take it. He was polite. He was respectful. But he also showed up as a man. Okay. But what Marcel and Maurice was doing, they were trying to test this gangster to see how much input Moses would allow them to put into him like they've done with everybody else, like they've done with uh, Martel, like they've done with uh, Big Lou. And Moses wasn't having it. And let me say something to you, Marceau. You almost lost your marriage because you are an asshole. You lost your marriage because you're mean to your wife and you didn't treat her right. Letitia has the demeanor that if you were nicer to her, I don't think she would have stepped one foot close to the door, even if you were cheating. But you became an asshole, a real big one, a few years ago. So you lost your wife because, listen, you were an ass. And the comments devastated her because they were true. Okay? It was a little bit more than cheating. Some women can deal with cheating if you treat them the way they want to be treated. And it never impacts what they're receiving from you emotionally. They don't have a deficit. They don't know about it. They didn't hear about it. But that's not what happened. You started treating her like a dog. Bingo was his name Oh, B-I-N-G-O. You started treating your wife like a dog on national television. And listen, let me tell y'all something. When a man start calling your ass by a letter and or an initial, he ain't feeling you. You start calling your wife T. When a nigga start calling you A, B, C, D, T, D, V, back up. Start assessing. He start calling that lady T. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm serious. Hold up now. I ain't no damn T. Even if my name is Letitia, don't be calling me T. It's baby, honey. Ask, you know what? Y'all know what I'm talking about. All right. Now, you were an asshole to her. That's why you almost lost your marriage. Not because of this show, not because of the mellow meters that you tend to blame everything on and everybody else trying to ruin your business. We know you didn't have bad business practices. We know you built everything that Zen Garden asked you to build beautifully. You have no idea why you're there. You have no idea. And as a matter of fact, the Melometers didn't do shit to you. It was Anthony Lofties that exposed you. It was him that called your wife's attorney and called your mother-in-law with the bop, bop, a loo, bop. It was him that brought on different people that said that you stole from them. So that's not a Melometer, honey. That's not a Melometer. That's a wanna meter. What what one to call him? A wanna meter. <laughs> a one, whatever he is. I don't know, but it ain't no melometer, so stop it. The people that came after you don't even like melody. So please stop it. Okay? Please stop it. Anywho, that is what he was trying to sell to Moses. And Moses was not having it. And I loved it. I, I feel like Marceau talks too much. And he's one of them people, he he comes to you and try to talk to you. And when you don't receive it, it shifts to an insult, low key. 
it shifts to an insult. He blames everything on everybody. And he talks too much. Everything to him is funny, which to me symbolizes that you're emotionally unavailable. And I feel like Letitia is settling and, or has settled for the bare minimum when it comes to love and marriage. Now, Maurice, shut up. Be quiet, Maurice. Maurice is talking about Moses needs destiny's blessing. Maurice, do you know you, ought, you used to come across as the most polished one? the less you would say. But the more Maurice talks, I actually, I'd be like, are you kidding me? Maurice, he, are you saying this man needs destiny's blessing? As if that's, that ain't his damn mama. Maurice is an idiot. He's a goofball, but he's a funny one. Okay. Maurice asked Moses, how old was he? (laughs) Y'all, that was the most awkward scene. He said, how old are you? (laughs) And then he was taken aback when Moses said 41 and Maurice should shut up. He shut up with the quickness. Cause I feel like you, you, you got tripped up on how Moses and, and your brain could not compute. How is Moses walking around with a six pack and I'm over here stuck with the dicky do disease and the dicky do disease y'all is when your belly stick out more than your dicky do. 